You're such a good public speaker. That was incredible. <laughs> well, I mean, wow. Take, a, take the time to look around at this. Hi, yeah. everyone. <laughs> How are you? Good. This is amazing. Wow. It was, it's wonderful to have you. Wow. And thank, thank you so you. much for, for taking the time out of your, your busy you. schedule. I know your uh, liver just telling me she's been moving about quite a lot. So it sounds well, like I just, a bit of I just moved um, house. I moved to England last August, about a year ago, and had two babies. And uh, we just moved house. So it's, we have four children, and we were packing and unpacking, sorting, and literally this week. So. So I just came out of the dust in the boxes and got all dressed up. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe this, nice, maybe this nice experience to... will help your, your children yeah. and, and you can encourage them to come to Oxford as well. Maybe <laughs> even they could be sitting in this chair one day, who knows? Yes, yeah. that would be amazing. Um, I wanted to start uh, my first question just sort of talking about your early influences and sort of the earlier stages in your life. Um, you did have quite an unusual start uh, in that you know, you're the daughter of Steven Tyler, but you didn't find that out until the age of eight. Um, and do, do you think that you would have gone into show business had you not been brought, brought up first by Todd uh, and then by Stephen? Um, I was raised mostly by my mother and my grandmother and my aunt. And actually my grandmother was a model in the 50s and she went on to be an etiquette sort of expert and she worked in Washington. So she was in a way a kind of an, an entertainer always. And then my mother was a model from a young age. She was with Eileen Ford um, at the age of 18 or something. She moved to, um, so they were my biggest influences probably in that way. And then my, both my stepfather, Todd Rundgren, and my father, Stephen Tyler, are musicians. So I definitely grew up with a lot of different creative sort of people around me for sure but I think it was probably my mother and my grandmother who were my greatest supporters or encouragers or and there we go we got um, our wine thanks Rob. <laughs> oh it's the best kind the little bottles in the we look after our guests I just um, made this TV show called gunpowder and I it was we filmed in Leeds and I took the train back and forth every day, and this was my treat to myself. <laughs> well, 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 yeah, it's our, our treat too. Thank you. Um, just, just picking up on, on what you said there, so. It was my mom who always told me, well, first of all, every, there was music always around the house, and my mom would play a lot of records. Iggy Pop was my favorite for some reason, and I would always be singing and performing, but I was, uh, I think I always thought that I would be musical in some way. And it was my mother who used to tell me that I was going to be an actress and she could see something. I've always been very empathetic and like I'm a sponge for people and uh, observing them and how they feel and kind of, I think even at a young age I had an awareness of emotion in a certain kind of way. And I think she um, saw that in me. So she was the one who, we moved to New York when I was 12, I think, and I started modeling and then people started asking me to go on auditions and I was very shy and I would have never done it if she hadn't sort of, not made me, but encouraged me to do it, so yeah. Even though my dad's, every, my dad's get all the credit because <laughs> yeah. they're really famous, but my mom and my, uh, the female support in my life were really, you know, a big part of it too. But I guess I, it's in the, the genes, I suppose, with the dad part. But. Yeah. Well, that, that was sort of going to be my, my follow-up question because reading articles about you and watching interviews, the focus always actually starts or, or, or seems to be on, on your dad, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, and actually, you, you, you do always highlight how supportive your, your mom, mother's been mm. throughout that process. One in particular, I was reading an article, I think that came out last week, and you were talking about the actual moment where you were at the festival um, and uh, Liv sort of looked in up Ken? at you, you saw, oh. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and you saw Mia and. and uh, oh, my, when I met my sister. Yeah, your sister, day, exactly. Yeah. Um, and and realised, and you, you turned to your mother. Uh, and she, I think you described her as having glazed eyes. Um, she was crying, yeah. And she sat you down and explained it all. And I wondered mm -hmm. what, if you could talk us through 
that conversation and sort of like what that meant for your relationship with your mother uh, and, and sort of the context to it. So that's sort of first part of the question. And, the, and then second part. Start with the first. I'm start with forget the first. It. Sort of like that, that, that my brain cells are small at the moment because I'm like, I'm still in a box at my house. <laughs> um, how did that affect me? Her, I, I think um, I remember, you know how you always look at your parents as being sort of, they're not a part of you in a way. You're, you sort of, you're in your own world and your own sort of head. That was the first time I ever really saw my mother as like um, someone that I really related to. Because I could, I felt so much for how she'd been carrying these questions and this secret and then sort of seeing her vulnerable in that way. Because you don't always see your parents in that sort of state. And for her to kind of admit to me like, oh yeah, that is your father and that's your sister and Todd's also your father. I mean, she always really presented it to me in a way that we were a, a kind of um, unconventional family of sorts. That um, did, did she um, always know then that Todd was? Did wasn't? you just pour me wine? Yeah, Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm going to drink that. That's true. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Did she, did she I get always so nervous. Know? That's why my voice is shaking. A little okay. bit. It's so strange. If the camera's on, I'm fine. But in um, big. Lots of people, like talk shows and award things and speaking in public. I'd love to get over it. I need to come here and take a debating course or just watch yeah. you. I wouldn't be allowed yeah, to. Yeah, Liv was saying she wants to do a debate uh, at some point, so I might ask the president-elect whether we can sort Could something. I just watch one? Yeah. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so did she always know that, um, that Todd wasn't your father? Um, I'm not sure, I don't want to get into too many details, but it was the 70s and she and Todd were in a relationship and then she kind of met Stephen and I think it was complicated, you know. Um, I think she loved both of them and was hanging around with both of them and definitely living with Todd, but Todd was off making records and doing his old thing and he had a really big, I mean still he's a, a huge part of my life, but. I remember being quite young and his um, lyrics were so profound and so beautiful and they always really touched my heart and I remember they made me think thoughts that I probably wouldn't have thought at such a young age because I would go and watch him play live and his songs were really very amazing. They weren't just simple pop songs, like the, the, the ideas behind them are really, um, really incredible. So that also had a big influence on me. Great. Uh, moving now uh, to your, f your sort of career and more sort of the focus on, on f your filming. Um, you, I, I was reading an article that started describing you as, uh, and said, you are an actress whose career has chased you a lot. Uh, you a lot, um, but um, sorry. You're an actress whose career has chased you a lot harder than you have chased it. Do you think that's a fair character characterization? Do you think um, that's correct, true? Well, I mean, I know I, I'm, I'm ambitious, but I'm kind of quietly ambitious. I'm not a very competitive person. And I guess I was always sort of like, like I said, my mother kind of egged me into going. She saw something in me and kind of had to push me through the door a little bit. And I do err on the side of being very shy. There's a lot of important people in my life that encourage me, like Bianca. You asked me to come here, and I was like, no way, I'll be so scared, I can't do it. And she said, no, no, you really should, and I, I need that little encouragement often with, um, with certain things for some reason. But um, if I fall in love with a character, and um, particularly with a filmmaker, I love the, my biggest draw to my job is um, that dynamic that you have with the director, sort of the the whole vision of, of everything, so. Um, but I do, I do pursue things that I really care about. I never wanted to be famous, I think, because I come from quite a famous family, so being second generation, you see all the things that aren't so great about the business, too, and, you know, there's, it's kind of a cliche, but there is a lot of bullshit in the entertainment industry, and, and and I don't really like that. I've always liked things that were quite real and authentic. And so um, it's just finding the balance, I guess, you know? Yeah. Your, your, your first major sort of breakthrough was 
I, I guess, with Stealing Beauty, mm -hmm. uh, which was a, f a fantastic film. Thank you. Um, how did you come about getting that sort of? Did you, was that something that you sought out to, to a role that you sought out, or were you approached? Um. Yeah, I'd done a couple of films before that. I did a film, I think the person who kind of really first discovered me was a director named James Mangold. And he's done like Girl Interrupted and um, Walk the Line and a lot of really amazing movies. But his first film he ever directed was a film called Heavy. And I met with him and I remember sitting in his apartment with him and I was sitting on his sofa and I remember the acting the scenes, I had to pretend there was an airplane going overhead. <laughs> we had a really beautiful connection and dynamic and that film happened. And I made two or three films and then, um, weirdly I was asked to be in an Aerosmith video, but it had nothing to do with my dad. It was the director that had directed the three, he, there was three, a story of like three videos and Alicia Silverstone was in all three of them, and the director of those videos asked my dad if I could be in one of them, because I was sort of a new girl on the scene. And then around that same time after that, Stealing Beauty happened, and it was a, a script that I read and I loved a lot, and um, I went and met with Bernardo. I was one of many girls that, that met with him, but I remember very well our, our first meeting because it was, uh, it, you know, you kind of, you know, and you just know something's going to happen and kind of work. We kind of just came together and it was, a, I, I could tell, he could tell and, and it was really great. I did have to come to London and screen test and work with Jeremy Irons and um, some of the other actors and Rachel Weiss was in that movie too. She was amazing in that part. Something that sort of stood out from your answers quite a lot is that you, you keep picking up on sort of like the how meaningful for you it is um, which director you're working with, uh, and you sort of have sort of hinted at the fact that you really enjoyed working with Bernardo, um, but you've also worked with Michael Bay, Peter Jackson of course, um, and Tom Hanks as well. Mm -hmm. Is that a sort of standout director that has stood out uh, to you? And why is it so much, why do you place so much importance? I feel so blessed by the projects that I have found or have found me or, um, because I have really had good experiences on, on all of them. Um, Robert Altman was a big part of my life. He, I was in two films with him and um, he's not with us anymore, which is so sad, but he had such a big, um, I don't know, he just had a style of filmmaking that and creating an overall atmosphere for the actor and the crew and that is quite old fashioned that a lot of directors did once upon a time and it's kind of going away a little bit and people are more interested in making movies really quickly and for less money and kind of rushing through and, and he always had this amazing thing that he all no matter how much the budget was he had his time with his actors and there we'd, we'd spent time like all together having dinners and watching rushes every night. We'd eat pizza and drink beer and watch our scenes and a film I did with Julianne Moore and Glenn Close and some amazing actors and we shot in the south and this tiny little town called Holly Springs, Mississippi and it was one of the greatest times of my life because we were all so close. It was probably like what you guys experience. Um, here, being in, in college and those dynamics and friendships that you make that are sort of forever, you know. Um, but he was really a very special director. He shot in a way that no one else really. Woody Allen is a, sort of similar in the style, but he kind of like mics everyone, so everyone has a mic. And um, he'll create these very long, elaborate shots where everything's, everyone's just doing their thing and you never really know when the camera's gonna be on you. Um, and it just was a really very special experience. He encourages you to completely go to town and create this character that you want and to not hold back. And he really wants you to feel confident in that. And, and that was really, uh, he was someone that I really enjoy, feel grateful that I got to, to be close to and learn from. So you sort of point, highlighted two main like, aspects with a director that you, you think are special. One is that they create a sort of sense of community amongst those who are sort of on the, working on the film and also sort of the technical ability. Do you have a sort of priority between the two? Would you prefer 
Uh, uh, maybe I'm quite I, obsessed with all the technical aspects of um, production. I always wind up going and sitting with the sound guy or the prop guy or something and just asking, or woman, excuse me. It's, sound guys are often guys, that's crazy. They hold the big long stick, they should be women too. Um, uh, or wardrobe or hair and makeup or just all the script supervisor. I mean, I always catch myself. I'm a very curious person, so I always kind of spy on people and watch what they're doing. And Because the, every aspect of, of that is a big, it's a, such a big part of it, you know? Everyone's job is so important and it's an art form, everything that everyone's doing and the kind of collaboration, so. With, with regards to sort of your acting in particular, um, during the formation of Stealing Beauty, you said something that I thought was quite interesting. Um, and that is that you like to separate yourself from the char character uh, mm -hmm. during production. Why, why was this? Is this a sentiment consistent in every film that you've been in? Well, people always ask what which character is the most like you, or what's, what about you is in this character? Well, feel free to answer that too. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess part of the experience is, it's like, you know when you fall in love and you're obsessed with someone and you can't stop thinking about them and you're, everything relates to them and that's kind of how I feel when I'm creating a character. It's just, it's happening inside of me. I'm always thinking of them and feeling through them and like I don't even realize I'm doing it but it's like a shift that that sort of happens so when people ask me to identify the things about me and my characters it's it's tricky for me to do that because I'm I'm so excited to not be thinking about myself <laughs> and to really be thinking about them and how they think and feel and what their circumstances are and um, and they're all so different you know and I, I guess sort of following on from that, um, with Armageddon, uh, I know it was, a, it was a movie that you turned down quite a few times. God, before, I don't remember that, that's before, so funny. Did I? Yeah, well, mm, apparently I you asked quite a few times, then you eventually said yes, and the reason for that was because I uh, think you were I just, scared of doing the movie, but that was the reason no, you ended up doing No, I wasn't scared. It. I think I just, because I was, I think, I just thought it was going to be like a big Bruce Willis action movie, and I, I didn't really understand I was, that was just me being a teenager, kind of going, oh, I don't know, do I want to be in a big action movie? Because I wanted to work with amazing directors. And, and then I went and met with Jerry Brockheimer and Michael Bay, Bay, and all these amazing actors started to come on board, like Billy Bob Thornton and Steve Buscemi, and um, they created this amazing, eclectic group of people. And, and, uh, and it actually turned out to be a movie that I'm really proud of and was, and I had some of my f most fun, crazy, bizarre experiences on that film. Like, I lived on an oil rig for a week uh, in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and I went to NASA and did all sorts of amazing things that I would have never done. So I enjoyed that movie a lot. I, I guess we can't really have an interview of that sort of talking about Lord of the Rings a little bit. Uh, I imagine that's why a lot of people have come out as well. Um, before going into sort of the substance of the movie, mm -hmm. I uh, heard from a source that you um, managed to get a sword from the from sword. the set, which you still have. No, is that they true? gave it to me as a Peter and Frank gave it to me as a gift. At the, um, the, yes, I have it. It was in my attic for a long time, and then recently my friend asked me to, David, my fiance, was like, baby, go get your sword, because a friend of mine is very obsessed with Lord of the Rings, so I brought it down. <laughs> um, and we were playing with it, but yeah. Yes. That's incredible. Do you, yeah. still, do you still have practice at all? Because you, you, you trained, right? You, I did You had train. to do sword fighting. Well, because they was... were trying to figure out, because Arwen's not really in the book that much. She's yeah. sort of in the appendix, and there's a lot of different... There's little mentions of her and their relationship, but they were trying to figure out how to incorporate her into the film. And originally, I was like a, you know, sort of uh, sword fighting and with the fellowship and Helm's Deep and all these places, it didn't really work and we wound up changing it, um, which was one of the great things about that experience because we shot over three and a half years um, the, between the, the main production and then each summer there was pickups. So, but that was longer than a normal film. That, that was sort of three, four months of, of pickups and stuff. So it was such an amazing experience, that whole thing going to New Zealand and that group of people are so talented. The, the Weta workshop 
people and I learned a lot from, I thought it was very interesting because I would go visit the Weta workshop, which is where they make all the prosthetics and the armor and the swords. And I would go watch them a lot and ask, um, I think it was Richard Taylor was the man who ran the place. And a lot of people would uh, want to work there and from the university and with a lot of skills. And But he would pick, he was allowing anyone to come in that had a particular skill set. So it wasn't like you had to have gone to school to be able to get in. He would actually just look at people and their talents and their arts and sort of bring them on. He was really giving a lot of people chances. Um, he's an incredible artisan, so it was amazing to see. Had you read the books before being offered them? No, I didn't, but I have my mom's original copies from the 60s, which is amazing, she gave to me. But um, no, I read the script first, which was strange. I didn't even really know that much about The Lord of Rings because I somehow, it wasn't um, a big passion of mine as a kid. Um, I knew of it, but I didn't know a lot about it. So I read the scripts first, which was so strange trying to focus because you're having all three of them and there's a lot of action and bizarre things and I didn't really fully understand everything that I, that I was reading. And that was so amazing because they called, I remember Peter Jackson called and I remember I was in California, I don't know why, because I've never really lived there, and I was in the Chateau Marmont, and I was sitting on my bed, and he called and asked me, offered me the part, and I was so excited, and I, but it was one of those things, I remember getting up and just jumping up and down on the bed afterwards, and kind of going, oh my God, I'm going to New Zealand for a year, that's crazy. So it was, that excitement was because you're going to New Zealand, did you know no. sort of it was like, <laughs> as in not, not, not necessarily no. like that, but. Like, I think it, you can undoubtedly say that it's an era-defining film. And right. my question is sort of like, did you know that it was going to be... I knew that it was all very groundbreaking, what we were doing, because it was so new. The, the first of all, making three films at once, and, and the technology really changed a lot while we were filming, which was interesting. The, the, the scale double kind of thing of having smaller people and bigger people and originally they had these things called big rigs which was like a giant me um, with a, a little dancer person inside on stilts so when the when it was like elijah and the, and the hobbits and Billy and dom and sean that these sort of big rigs would walk by in the background and then that didn't really look right so then they kind of got like a real giant person and then some smaller people who were actually three foot six, and so it was this constant, um, every scene was different, um, the, the size sort of scale. And then by the end of it, it was a whole other thing with face replacement and um, Andy Serkis and his work was just absolutely brilliant. But it, it really evolved over the course of, of making the films and that was so interesting to see, and it's funny because I haven't been back and I'd love to go back, but we shot, I mean, half of the sets were on in like these like factories under the airport and these planes would fly by all the time and there were so many wind machines and people with megaphones shouting, you know, things for us to do. So we had to do the whole, the whole film is all ADR'd, like doing like a radio play. We had, it took months to do just the voice work for that because we had to all essentially totally redo our parts in a sound stage afterwards which was really interesting but yeah are you, are you still friends with any of the cast because i know i, I said am, we had yeah. ian last I week know, I, like, haven't oh, I haven't seen, seen ian, ian in, ages. in a long time i'd love to see him um yeah we all kind of see each other every once in a while or occasionally like on instagram i found Dominic and Billy the other day and I was so excited. <laughs> I don't have your number anymore. How are you? Um, but it's funny time because I've never seen Vigo again, I don't think, which is crazy. I'd love to see him. Um, yeah, time flies, doesn't it? I mean, I think I was 19 or something when I made this and I'm 40. I don't know where those 20 years went. <laughs> I have to ask um, that this sort of there's still this rumor that you um, can still speak Elvish fluently. <laughs> can can you? Uh, can, uh, yeah, would you mind sort of sharing some well, Elvish? I, didn't, I just I can and I can say a couple lines. There's like certain lines I can remember for some reason. Um, I'm trying to think. 
I feel um, like just like in the in the in the movie, oh, you I know just sort of I know. stare at the camera I know and do the, that. Um, is it Nino Hithaiglir, Lasto Beth Dyer, Rimo Nin Bruin and Danin Ulayer? That's the like um, when I raise my sword in the river and the horses come. <laughs> <laughs> That's a made that. Um, yeah, I guess it stayed forever. I actually just worked with the dialect coach um, Roshin, who. I learned my English accent and all the Elvish for on that film. She helped me with Gunpowder, which I just filmed with my English accent, and it was really amazing how much of the foundation we'd laid that many years ago that helped me now to be able to kind of, it's such an, an interesting thing doing different accents, especially if going from American to English, it's like the tongue, everything moves. Differently. Well, how does that actually work with your dialect coach? Are you, just, are you um, sitting down for an hour and sort of, how? Well, now I'm working a lot. Roisin introduced me to this woman named Budgie, who I've been working with a lot. And she, um, we spend a lot of time together. I mean, I'll, a lot of times we face, sometimes we face time at night after I get the kids to bed. And sometimes she comes and stays with me or on the train, on the way. And it's, uh, you know, it's a process because it, it's, a way of kind of exploring the text and memorizing the lines, but the sounds are so specific, so we have to really break it down to get the ac to be really accurate with it, kind of. So it's a process, but it's one that I'm really grateful for. You kind of have that. It's like having a great companion to kind of help you prepare, um, and it's just a process. And even on the day, she'll come up to me and whisper that there's a certain sound that I'm not getting right or something, or um, right. vowel sounds are so hard. But it's really fun. Ste stepping back a little bit, what I think is quite striking with your career is that you've, you've worked on so many different genres of film. Mm -hmm. So you sort of, you've been in a comedy drama, Jersey, uh, Jersey Girl, um, and you've been in a horror, the horror movie, The Strangers, which I think is fantastic. <laughs> that was one of yeah. my favorite movies ever. Um, to make. Well, have you got a favorite genre that you've worked on? A um, favorite genre? Yeah. Um, no, they're all amazing. I mean, it's so fun and incredible to get to play so many different kinds of characters. Um, I guess I enjoy being a character actor more than anything, which is interesting because in my early days I was always cast as the ingenue and the sort of young girl and to someone's girlfriend or boyfriend, and, and, and I always was rebelling against that a little bit and wanting to be doing things that weren't what everyone wanted to put me in, because there was a ton of movies that I probably should have done that would have been better for my career technically, but I was like, oh, no way, <laughs> I don't want to do that. But it was just because I was young and I thought, oh, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to do that movie. Um, but you really have to do take all of it into consideration because it is a career and you are building. Um, you have to make certain decisions by, based on that. But I really always followed my heart and loved. I, I would never want to do the same thing again right after doing it because I wanted to do something else. So um, that's where great directors come in because really, really good directors will see something in you and know that you're capable of doing anything in a way. And sometimes it's the things that you're the least likely right for that are your best parts in a way because um, it, people see you with fresh eyes and you see yourself with fresh eyes having that, that um, opportunity to kind of be that character. You, you've since transitioned into TV with uh, The Leftovers. Uh, how, how has that transition been? Have you enjoyed TV more than film? Um, that's been an interesting one, because I, I think deep in my heart, I really appreciate I love the, the whole experience of filmmaking, creating, you know, knowing what you're making. It's one script, it's one story. Everyone's working towards that thing. You know where what's going to happen. Um, TV is sort of open-ended because you sign on as that character and you know who the creators are, but the directors change and the storylines change. And like on The Leftovers, we all signed on for one thing and then suddenly we were moving to Austin, Texas and the whole cast changed, <laughs> half the cast changed and then the rest was in Australia. And, but it was actually a really 
amazing growing experience for me because it forced me to step out of my comfort zone and to be okay with not knowing what's going to happen next. Um, there's only so much preparing you can do when you don't know what you're shooting in two weeks and they're not going to tell you even what the storyline is. So you kind of, it's a little bit more like real life in that you know who you are, but you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or today or at any time. So, and I played a completely um, kind of wild woman <laughs> and that was really fun for me because it wasn't, my reactions are so different to hers. She had really big explosive reactions to things and I couldn't think too much about it. I just had to kind of like go for it and it was really life changing for me in a lot of ways because ever since then I've been a little bit more free when I'm on set. <clears throat> and just willing to try things in a different kind of way. It, it sounds though like it's still quite unpredictable in the fact that you're saying you've gone from Austin, Texas to Australia yeah. and you now have sort of two very young kids, two and one I think, mm -hmm. right, Sayla and, and Lula. Um, does that mean that you're going to sort of step back a little bit from acting whilst you sort of your, your kids grow up or are you still going to try and... Well Milo's going to be 13 yeah, my, in yeah. a couple of weeks so you know, I, I did, I've, I've always worked a lot. There was a moment when Milo was little that um, I didn't work as much. <clears throat> and then one day recently we were sitting at the dinner table and he's very mature for his age. And he said, mom, you need to go forth and make more movies. Those were his exact <laughs> words. And I was like, just, it was such an amazing, beautiful. And I said, okay, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, I know you really, I know you love me and you've, you're such a great mom and thank you. And he was like, but you know, I'm getting a little bit older now. And I, he was like just saying he's cool with having his space and that he wanted me to do what I was passionate about. It was very sweet. And ever since then, I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then I kind of like made a little prayer to the universe. And then suddenly all these crazy things have been coming along and I've been uh, doing all different kinds of acting things. and. I designed a clothing line and then I did a lingerie campaign for Triumph and all. I p produced a little short um, film that David Beckham was in for um, Bell Staff and I've just been doing all these different sort of things and, and, and um, it's been really fun. I've actually probably working more now than I ever have in my whole life. So it's tricky with the babies but it's good because they don't always notice, but I've, I've weirdly been home a lot, but still working a lot. Like gunpowder was perfect. I worked like three days a week and came home and they didn't really notice that I was gone. And, uh, <laughs> and now um, it's nice. It's a nice, it's, I have a different kind of um, focus capacity now, I think, because when I go to work, I'm really at work and I'm really focused on what I'm doing in that moment. And I think as a mother, you're really multitasking all the time. You're all over the place and you're conducting this huge orchestra of the home and everyone's education and school and what's going on with everyone. And, and so when I go to work, it's almost like a vacation for me now because I just memorizing my lines and thinking about my character and having this amazing, creative, you know, fulfilling experience. So it's nice. Great. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for answering my questions. Uh, if you don't mind, we'll open up to the audience. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand nice and high and wait for the microphone uh, to come to you. Yeah, let's start with you just on the front there, just on the front row there, in the brown jacket. Hi. Um, thanks for coming. You're lovely. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, like, you mentioned the leftovers and your character in that the group they were in, they didn't speak very much. Was it weird having to like give up your dialogue and still act? How much more work did you have to do? Was it different? Um, yes, to that ex extreme, because the characters couldn't speak at all. That was, it was definitely um, interesting. But I'm, I like the, the, I always wind up wanting to cut dialogue because I feel often like I can convey with emotion or just with movement or something, things sometimes that are written on the page. So in general, I, Edward Norton once said to me, you're so crazy, you're like the only person I've ever worked with who's trying to cut all their dialogue, but you're like a silent <laughs> film star. And I said, that's so funny, but I do, um, it, it, it's, 
interesting if you, I mean, dialogue's such an incredible thing, especially if it's well written. But that, to really have to convey and communicate with other people with no words is a, a whole other, and with a camera on you, is, is, it was really interesting. Um, it was definitely, it was challenging, but it, w it was interesting. I really liked it, actually, but. Great, thank you for that question. Yeah, let's come down to you. Um, so, as you said, like growing up, you never actually wanted to pursue acting as a career, and then, um, and it's not, it wasn't also about fame, because you, your parents were already very famous, and you have seen all their life. Uh, but after your first breakthrough, after your a couple of movies, like what is it that kept you going in that direction? It wasn't fame. So what was the most important factor in that regard? It was just that connection and that total bliss that I feel when I'm doing whatever it is that I'm doing. It's so, it's so hard to articulate, but it just feels good. And everyone has something in life that really makes them feel good. And I've always felt so blessed that I got to make a living doing that thing. Because I know a lot of people go to work every day and they might not be doing the thing that's their passion and that they do that in their sort of spare time or something. So I've always been aware of that and really grateful. And even as, because I, I started working when I was 13 or 14 or something. So I didn't, hadn't, hadn't really had a chance to decide what I wanted to be when I grew up. I thought, oh, I want to be a marine biologist. I want to be a singer, and I was still very innocent in my thinking, and then suddenly I had this incredible career, um, and I, I was discovering it, I guess, as it was discovering me, so I always felt very blessed and grateful, and like there was something, um, you know, it's a great learning. I'm so grateful that I get to do something that I learn so much from every day. Thank you for that question. Yeah, let's go to you in the orange jumper. <laughs> um, you've mentioned a lot about how y y your fascination about things go on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So the time you spent in the workshop in New Zealand and hair and makeup, things like that. Have you ever been tempted to get behind the camera yourself? Um, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, I, I think just by nature of who I am as a person, I'm very detail oriented, and um, I can't help but get involved in every aspect. So I'm I'm comfortable and I love being an actor, but I still can't help but get my hand on everybody else's pot a little bit and observe and watch and. Um, yeah, I think at some point it would be incredibly fun to direct and um, produce, and it's really fun to be on set when it's not when you're not on camera. It's a totally different experience. Um, I've done it a little bit, and it is quite thrilling in a different kind of way. Um, I don't have. I'm not pursuing doing that every minute right now because I'm just really happy with where I am, but I definitely do think about it in the back of my mind as something that I would really like to um, see if that happens. And I think it would be about finding the project if you have that one thing. And I've always been looking for years. I've been sort of asking and paying attention and trying to find it. But I, I think that it would have to be because of a specific something that I thought, oh, that's, that's the thing, you know? Thank you for that question. Yeah, let's go just to you along. Hi, Liv. Um, Hi. I was just wondering whether you ever find yourself watching the films back, um, uh, The Lord of the Rings in particular, sorry. Um, I know a lot of actors and actresses who don't. Um, and if so, when you look back, are there any particular moments, uh, be it a line, a scene, or a quote in the film that are special to you, if you have any favorite moments? Um, in particular, yourself and Viggo Mortensen had some really quite memorable moments. Um, whether that was at the time of filming or now looking back, is there anything that particularly stands out as special for you? Um, yeah, it's funny. I, I often don't look back because I'm kind of shy and watching yourself is kind of like hearing your voice on someone's answering machine or something. <laughs> if we still have answering machines or hearing, it's that thing of, um, 
I always like to see everyone's work, um, and it's it's a it's a great experience. But I, I, you know, you just keep moving in life. You don't sit around watching your old work. But I should sit down because sometimes I think, oh, you know, that was an amazing film, and I should sit down and watch it. But it's just one of those things that I I don't I don't do, but I should. <laughs> but I should. <laughs> Um, and then when I look at it, I just go, oh my God, look, it's such a, a, an amazing memory or, um, yeah, it's quite a nostalgic, nostalgic and emotional experience, I guess. When things come on TV sometimes, I might watch for a few minutes and then I run, I run away. But I haven't even finished watching Gunpowder or The Leftovers, if you can believe it. That's because I've been so, you know, having two small children. I don't get to watch TV that much, but I'd like to. <laughs> Great, thank you for that question. Yeah, let's come to you in the back top. Yeah. Hi, following up the previous question, you sort of mentioned that you didn't really care too much for fame at the, sort of at the start. Did you at any point sort of get the choice between maybe theatre and sort of being on stage as opposed to being on the big screen? And if so, sort of what made you kind of pick the big screen as opposed to, I don't know, spending time on stage and doing the more perhaps low-key things? I am not a classically trained actor at all. I never went to an acting class in my entire life. I've never done a stage production. I think in first grade I was in a Christmas thing, dressed as <laughs> Santa in a car. I've always had um, this stage fright Thing for some reason, which has probably prevented me from pursuing that. And I really love something about the intimacy of um, the camera and the, I don't know, there's something quiet and still and beautiful that I experience for me. But that's just because what I, I probably, because it's what I know. Um, and theater's always been this thing that, I, I always wished that, because I, I started working so young and I always thought I would go to, to college or to university or study. And then I thought, oh, well, I'm living the, li the life, you know, the school of life. <laughs> and so it sort of just happened that I didn't do that. But it is something that I always um, look back and think, oh, I wish I'd had that sort of incubation period of in your early 20s when you get to explore and have that freedom and... and um, um, but I would love to take on the challenge of doing theater at some point, but again, I think it would have to be, maybe I'd, I'd really have to feel safe with a, with a director and I'd have to learn a skill set really that would be completely foreign to me. But I'd love to learn, but um, it's just something I, I never, I have not done yet, I guess. But um, I'm very interested in it. I love to go to the theater. Great, thank you for your question. We have time for one more. Uh, yeah, let's go to you at the back. Yeah, stripe the arm. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, I really found it interesting that you pointed out how Arwen in Tolkien's book, um, she just appears in the index, so, or the independence, and she's not really part of the story. And you were also saying how there are certain movie roles, like just being the pretty girlfriend that you don't really want to do. And that just made me think, um, what are your thoughts on you know, the position of women in the movie industry in general? And is there something you actively do to improve it? That's a very good question. Um, I don't like to generalize anything, and that is a big question to answer, I think, in this moment. Um, I. I feel very grateful for all the parts that I have, and, and it's easy to sort of say, oh, that's how it is, and, but it's your job to sort of break that mold for yourself, you know? Um, I think I, I was just making a comment, I think more about age and the variety of parts as you mature and uh, go from being a young girl into a woman. And right now I'm really, um, and loving the parts that I'm getting to play. Um, um, in Gunpowder, I didn't have a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend. I was a, completely just this, this really very interesting female character that I really loved getting to play that was very different from anything I'd ever done in a period that, I, that was sort of new to me. And um, um, 
I'm not doing a very good job of answering this question. <laughs> it's such a big question. I don't. I mean, I, it's hard. It's it's probably better in a discussion than in a one-on-one -on -one discussion, I guess. Great. Thank you for that question. I'm afraid that is all we have time for. Thank you. Uh, so please join me in thanking Liv Tyler. <laughs> <laughs>